uh, today's space is going to be all about S curves and Bitcoin, Bitcoin one million and ten million. Uh, we're gonna, we're going to cover both one million and ten million possibilities. Uh, I want to just give a little shout out to Giovanni, who is the uh, original kind of power law guy, uh, and I want to talk a little bit about some other people uh, because. A lot of people have been, and I agree with this, they've been saying, well, there is something new that's happening here, right? There's these ETFs, and these ETFs have really changed the game for adoption, right? Because, you know, up until these ETFs, if you wanted to get Bitcoin, you had to go send money to, uh, you know, uh, you had to send money to Coinbase and... Um, you know, or or get a wallet and learn how to self custody all that. Now, now you don't have to do that. And every Tom, Dick, and Harry with a Schwab account now can uh, can have an account. So, uh, if you watch my latest video, um, I talk. There is a lot of math theory behind S curves, and I and I and actually one of them was recommended to me by uh, Giovanni himself, and that is the Gompertz model, right? And um, and the Gompertz model, you know, is used to kind of uh, model tumor growth and a bunch of other things. But one of the models, the thing that I found very, very interesting about this model was uh, that it was, um, that could be useful, for, it was useful for modeling a mobile phone adoption, right? So if you have something like mobile phone, completely new technology, you know, I don't know when the actual first mobile phone came out, but, you know, you started seeing them in the 80s, uh, very few of them. And, you know, here we are 45 years later, everybody on the planet's got a mobile phone, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, if you look at Bitcoin, you sort of go, okay, what's hyper-Bitcoinization? And, you know, I think, it, I think it's useful to think in terms of today's dollars, right? Because... Uh, you know, if you just start talking about hyperinflation, all that, it, it muddies the, the it muddies the equation. So let's just say, in today's dollars, what's hyper Bitcoinization? You know, it's probably somewhere like twenty million dollars uh, per Bitcoin, ten twenty million dollars per Bitcoin. That's kind of, by the way, the number that Hal Finney came up with. You know, in in sort of twenty ten when he sort of projected what what could it be worth, and he thought that could happen by. 2045, right? Um, so here we are 20, 20 years in front of that date. And could we have, could we get to sort of hyper Bitcoinization in 20 years? That's the, that's the first question. Uh, could it happen faster than 20 years, right? Um, so I did some modeling. And uh, if you look at these Gompertz models, you could actually get them to batch the current data, not, not, not so bad. And, um, what that means is that, you know, these things could be an alternative to the power law to even explain the first 15 years of Bitcoin prices. Uh, but they have a very different shape for the next uh, 15 years, right, or the next 20 years. So instead of looking like just a, a parabola, you know, where the thing just keeps on going up forever, these things kind of level out, at least in terms of sort of... Um, in terms of dollars or, or in terms of purchasing parity versus other things. And I think that's, that's a good way to look at it. So Legion, uh, go ahead and let's start a conversation along the themes of S curves and, uh, and you know, when 1 million, when 10 million. All right, Legion, go ahead. And Thomas, I'm trying to make you a speaker, by the way, I can't seem to do. Oh, right. you there? Hey guys, do you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, guys. So, uh, <clears throat> to be honest, I need to refresh my knowledge about S curves. I didn't look into them for a while, but I guess it makes a lot of sense. Uh, mainly the point that Bitcoin can't expand uh, to this infinite level according to power law because it would just be not make any sense like if it will grow with the power of six indefinitely uh, infinitely so so, so um, just on that mm -hmm. point i want to i want to stop there just because 
a lot of people are going to immediately interject that, you know, Bitcoin's going up forever against fiat that's depreciating. And, you know, this may be the case, but it's not going up forever versus New York apartments. You know, and let's just take that being a you know, sort of a fixed thing. You know, you, you, you're going to have some ratio of one Bitcoin buys you X number of New York apartments. Uh, and right now it's less than one. And maybe you get to one, and maybe you get to ten, maybe you get to a hundred, but you're not going to get to a million. One Bitcoin buys you a million New York apartments. So keep on going, Legion. Yeah, yeah. So of course we can just. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin can't uh, absorb value which doesn't exist in general because we, as a civilized uh, civilization, produce uh, energy, produce uh, goods and services, and so on. And we can, I guess, a seller says represented as economic energy and, for example, in form of New York apartments, which store it. So it uh, can't expand uh, without, I mean, it can expand with progress, but I doubt that it will be to such a high degree. And um, so <clears throat> I guess this curve makes more sense. Uh, and also, as I already said several times, I guess ETF um, increases the speed of adoption and potential speed of adoption and uh, price um, and demand on BTC. So as you said, I, I guess uh, <clears throat> S-curve would give a bit steeper increase in price. Did I get it correctly? Or maybe I didn't. Yeah, and so along the, so I'd agree with that. So I think, look, but along the lines, I think one of the, the dangers of, of things like uh, Giovanni's model or the, um, this sort of now, I would say, somewhat discredited uh, stock-to-flow model, which I really think, it, the more I look at the stock-to-flow model, the more I'm just like, this model is not accurate, you know. And it's not, it's not that it's not accurate from a uh, mathematical correlation point of view. It's just not accurate from the way to really think about Bitcoin price. So just, to, just a you know, little side note on that. Uh, look, if I take a monotonic function, if... Time is correlated, the log of time is correlated with the log of Bitcoin. And I take anything that goes up linearly or monotonically with the, 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 uh, with time, like, you know, uh, uh, let's just say wolf population in Yosemite, in Yosemite National Park, right? Well, the wolf population is now going up over the last 15 years because they've reseeded wolves over there. But it doesn't mean that wolf population is driving Bitcoin. It's just insane, right? It's correlation, but not causality. And I think just because we have scarcity, does, is, that's not the reason why Bitcoin's going up. Bitcoin's going up because it's a revolutionary new money, which is also scarce, but which has all these other great properties, right? So it is not fact, just a fact that this is because of scarcity. So, so... So that's stock to flow. Now, if we look at these new S curve models, you know, the only thing we don't know, we do not know where the how the ETF is going to play in, how the acceleration of of some S curve towards an asymptotic value. We don't know, right? But we do know one thing: that if you sell your Bitcoin, you're very possibly never going to be able to buy your Bitcoin back below that price ever again. Right. And, and that that I think is the biggest danger, because some people are saying, well, I'm just going to use this model for trading. Right. And if you tr you trade using these models, you know, the model is like, well, I'm above the trend line. Great. I'll sell it. Well, great. Now you just you just um, you just lost your your ticket. So, you, you know, it's you are no longer participating in the in the bit, the Bitcoin bull rush anymore. So, uh, Ben, what do you think? Oh, well, you caught me off guard. I'm working on some other numbers trying to see if uh, increase in market cap that quick, say, you know, to get to a million in four years versus eight, what kind of market cap increase uh, is possible based on real world examples we've seen. And so I was just Googling real estate. Um, and I just think it's really interesting because, um, I mean, a million in four years, part of me is like, holy shit, is that even possible? But Worldwide real estate, if you just look at residential real estate, it's like 200 and 
uh, what was it, $287 trillion in 2022. And the other data point was that in worldwide, S worldwide real estate grew by 8% in 2020. So, you know, I know these are different years, but let's just, I mean, 8% of 280 trillion is 23 trillion. And worldwide inflation was only, was less than 2%. So it's not all inflation of money that did the 8% growth of that real estate. So, I mean, point being is this is a competing store of value asset, real estate, and it's come into vogue as such, especially in 2020, you know, those big years leading up to 2000, or these are just big years for real estate. But all Bitcoin needs to be is seen as a analog for store of value. And I think access to tens of trillions can happen not in four years, but it can happen in a year. Anyways, that's just what I'm pondering. I know it took us off off your line of thinking, but I'm trying to challenge yeah, it, this. It very well could, Ben. I mean, look, there's, there's, we do not know. I think the one thing is we do not know. There's nothing that any of this math or any of these power laws or anything tell us uh, about a you know an upper limit on how fast things can move, right? Things can move very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. We know that now. So, <laughs> so the one thing the one thing I would not do is I would not sell based on the idea of trying to buy it back earlier. That that I think would be a very very bad mistake. Um, yeah, yeah. That's that's just kind of my. My, my, uh, let me see. I got a few more people asking. Oh, David Bailey, and I got Flossy, I guess. Uh, uh, Miles, uh, Becca. Miles, go ahead. Hey, Fred, how's it going? Um, uh, I think we actually might have, I was looking at your LinkedIn. Uh, I think we might have met back in your tag world days. Actually. Okay. Oh, cool. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so I think. I've been, you know, I've been into Bitcoin since 2011 and I've obviously seen a lot of ups and downs and been trying to sort of wrap my head around how do you estimate price? Like, I think ultimately on the upside, first of all, I don't think you can use any of these models to trade. I completely agree with you. The stock to flow never really made sense. It's just a correlative graph. Um, I think on the upside, it's extremely hard. I, I don't, ultimately, I think the upside price of Bitcoin is driven by a network effect adoption curve because that is what it is. It is a consensus among people that this thing stores value. And as more and more people get infected with that mind virus, more and more people believe. And so I think that's, that is the curve. The only one that the only aspect of pricing that I think you can use some further logic around is the downside price, which I definitely believe that um, the average cost of mining is the floor for the Bitcoin price. And I think that's why ultimately it never goes to zero. I mean, because that's really what you have to ask. Like if there is a way for it to go to zero, probably would have already gone to zero. And it needs some sort of support to be worth anything. And if it's worth anything, then it follows a network effect S curve. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of how I think about it. That seems, uh, that seems to make sense to me. Um... Uh, David, uh, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I generally agree with that. And first off, Fred, I just want to say uh, killer takes as of as of late. So, well done, sir. There's there's not or enough. Anybody else uh, uh, have any thoughts on uh, on Miles's perspective? Oh, he's speaking. Oh, yeah. Can you not hear me, Fred? David is speaking. I don't think you're hearing him, Fred. All right, I'll leave him. No, he you take so, Fred. David, but yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, like if you look at the if you look at the lower bound of the price, it pretty consistently it does not go below the average cost of supply, even at its lowest. It has dipped just below it a couple times, and it also makes sense rationally because huge amounts of capital have been deployed into mining infrastructure, and the incentive is such that if you're generating Bitcoin. And if the price is lower than your cost to produce, you're not going to sell. And if the price is higher than your cost to produce, you may sell. Now, it's a little bit opaque. We don't ever know precisely what the average cost of production is worldwide. But, you know, you can get some of that data online. Um, anyway, I mean, that's the only thing that seems super firm. And then on the upside, again, like, and I think the current environment has shown us 
it can move way faster than we think. And Fred, you've been speaking a lot about the ETFs. I mean, anybody who's looked at the inflow numbers, it's totally insane. And I think it's inexorable. And now, you know, if you look at any financial asset, once it becomes, quote, financialized, the sky's the limit. I mean, look at mortgages and mortgage-backed securities and, you know, D squared mortgage back securities and stuff like that. it just kind of infiltrates well, the financial even as, and even more now because I think if you look at it right now from the way that kind of Wall Street you know the fund management over the last twenty years has starting to think about assets they really just look at is the thing you know a top market cap asset right you know Bitcoin now is right it's kind of in the top six, right, of any kind of, like, stock uh, that's available on, on sort of, uh, in the S&P. If, if Bitcoin was in the S&P, it would be the top six company, yep. right? And so that's number one. And number two, you know, what is this kind of uh, metrics, both from a kind of one-year, two-year, five-year return, and also, you know, what, are, what is its sharp ratio? And it's, it's just doing great on all those metrics, and therefore, people will buy it, right? So, right. Yeah, totally. I mean, I I, I agree. Um, and and for what it's worth, like three four months ago, before the ETF introduction, it felt like we were going to follow the, sort of the similar pattern where maybe it would have hit an all time high prior to the having, but probably not. But instead, I mean, here we are already at an all time high. I mean, I think we could break a hundred k before the having. And I think that, you know, if you look at historical cycles at roughly 10 X's from the previous base, so you would have expected it to go to like 150, 200 K on the spell run. And I think easy four to 600 K. And I don't think it's insane to say that it could go to a million. I mean, it really depends uh, in this run. And also, I think you've talked about this a bit too, but I also don't think it's totally clear what the correction looks like uh, you know, with the ETFs in play. I mean, I don't know, you know, how strong are those holders? I don't know. But it probably should smooth out. So I don't think this next dip will be as big. But, you know, who knows? I think it's a little unclear. You know, I think the only... The only yeah, well, those holders... Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Jimmy. Oh, sorry, I was just going to riff on that because those holders with... I bet buying seven hundred sixty six million, I think the number was yesterday, during the worst day in a long time, we're dropping six to eight percent. And I bet is just they're buying seven hundred million during that. And in the face of GBT selling uh, I think three hundred and something million, like this thing I think these ETF holders are going to add a whole new thing and they're proving it more and more as the days go by that they're going to be holders and, and bullish. So I'll I think one of the big mistakes that the Bloomberg guys made with these ETFs was they modeled the ETFs off, off of other ETFs like gold or something. Mm -hmm. And those ETFs had a pattern where you had a huge rush in the first month and then it sort of petered out. Right. And everybody thought there was a lot of people saying that, right? That you know, there's going to be this like one month, and then that's it. And I, you know, I, I really think that that is that's a flawed model. And I think even the Bloomberg guys are realizing now that it's a flawed model. Uh, and it's not just flawed in terms of um, numbers; it's sort of directionally flawed. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, look, there, it. it to the people that are probably listening right now, it sounds silly to say that buying Bitcoin on Coinbase is hard, <laughs> but like for my parents, it is, you know, like it's, it's a pain in the butt. Like you have to move money from a regular bank account to this weird Coinbase thing. And there's two factor authentication and they've obviously heard about Bitcoin being stolen all the time and they probably would get, would get fished instantly. Um, you know, buying it on, you know, Fidelity or Schwab or whatever is like a million times easier. Um, so I, I just, yeah, I, I think that there's, there's still a massive, massive, massive amount of people that do not own Bitcoin and a massive, massive, massive amount of demand. And I think the ease of use, people are underestimating how much easier it is. Um, so I, I agree. I think that the buying is yeah. inexorable. I mean, look, I think the question is when it goes to 
three, four, five, six hundred K, wherever it's peaking towards on this run, you know, that's a 10 X return from here, or depending on where it goes five to 10 X, let's say people will sell. So I think the question is, what is the makeup of the buyers who are buying in these ETFs? And I don't know if that data is available, but if it's largely like individuals, um, then, you know, they're going to sell, but I think the, that, like that announcement that came out, uh, that what is it? BlackRock is including the Bitcoin ETF and some of their other portfolios. I think if you see more like that, like if there is a huge amount of buying that occurs in a cycle where the Bitcoin ETF is being in, incorporated into other products that are managed by professional money managers. And, or if you see more sovereigns buying it beyond like El Salvador and stuff, then I think those people are not really going to be sellers. So I think the question will be, what does the distribution look like? I, and, you know, I don't know. Hey, can you all, uh, can you all hear me? We can, yes. I can hear you now. Hear you. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, well, uh, first off, uh, Fred, I just want to say, uh, your takes of late have been on fire. So, so keep it up. Um, in terms of what Miles just said on, on uh, what's the composition look like, you know, people will definitely sell and buy on the way up. Like, this is an emotional experience that people are going to be going through, and, and y you harden soldiers over time. So, you know, the, the, yeah, I, I think uh, <laughs> we have a big wave of, of green, green hodlers. Um, the, the passive investors you're talking about will actually be, in my opinion, the biggest sellers. Because they're going to be rebalancing their portfolios mm. uh, constantly on the way up, um, uh, as they, as they should, um, and so that will be kind of a consistent kind of uh, sell selling that will happen. Whereas, like retail and individuals, um, you know, they're going to be completely uh, uh, emotionally affected by FOMO. They're going to be like, you know, <laughs> it's like piling in and then you know getting freaked out and selling like. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, uh, I think it's going to be the institutional investors that are going to have the most systematic approach to selling. Uh, the, the reason I joined the space, I, uh, was, um, on a kind of a different point, um, which I heard, uh, Fred, you say, uh, hyper Bitcoinization, uh, implies, you know, Bitcoin $10 million price. And I actually think that that number is way too bearish. And I was curious kind of, you know, I know how threw that number out in the past. You know, it's one thing to throw that number out when like Bitcoin is, you know, has no trading price. So I don't know how well reasoned uh, that number was. And you know, well, here's, kind of here's, here's the number, David. Here's here's how here's how to think about it, right? If you look at kind of the total amount of the you know the total value of stocks, bonds, and real estate right now, it's 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 around nine hundred uh, trillion dollars, right? Worldwide, right? And so, if you take nine hundred trillion and you just sort of say, uh, you know, what is 20, 20 million uh, Bitcoin? Well, that's four hundred million dollars, right? It's four hundred trillion dollars. So, you know, four hundred out of uh, nine hundred plus four hundred—that's thirteen hundred. So, it's a third, roughly, of the world's wealth would be in Bitcoin. And so, you know, the only way that's bearish is mm -hmm. if. Whatever the you're you're dividing it by just goes to pot, right? But I think we can sort of separate that out, sort of conceptually, in our in our heads by saying that we're saying twenty million dollars in constant dollars, right? So, 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 that, so that's what I would say: twenty million dollars, or, or ten, somewhere between ten and twenty million dollars in constant dollars, is kind of where I would put the max on Bitcoin. It's not going to get more than that because the, the world economy is not going to grow at 30% per year. Uh, you know, yeah, real. Yeah. Well, so a couple things to ask about that. So one, the $900 trillion number, is that encompassing of all assets globally? So uh, uh, All assets globally. Okay, and, and how do you factor in things like derivatives or, um, uh, you know, different... Uh, different synthetic assets that are created that have a value in the quadrillions well they do but you know they're 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 pluses and minuses there you know what i mean so because they're quote unquote derivative right so i i would just not put that look at the end of the day what are the real assets of the yeah. world right yeah. the real assets of the world are the stock market right? 
the U.S. stock market, the Chinese stock market, the European stock market, and, you know, real estate, right? And, and real estate is bigger than stocks, right? So that overall, right? Real estate is a bigger market right now, you know? Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. I think it's on the order of $300 trillion worldwide real estate. But I think if you look at, you know, it's not over a quadrillion right now. So, you know, you can really say there is a sort of finite amount where you have hyper-Bitcoinization. It's not, it's not Bitcoin at $100 million right now in today's dollars. Well, well, Are you including so, uh, commodities in that $900 trillion? And debt? Yeah. Yeah, you are including all oil oh, and all gold. Yeah. I mean, gold, for example, is only a is only only a fifteen trillion dollar market, and it's the biggest of all the metals, right? And yeah. uh, you know, oil is worth what seventy trillion or something. So we're not there's not you know we we do have a sort of finite amount of wealth in the world. Well, and totally. So, yeah, I mean that's why it's an S curve. I mean there there is the it can't it's not going to go to infinity. Right? Well, so 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 let me throw something else out there too. Like the in terms of you know hyper Bitcoinization, to me hyper Bitcoinization means that uh, Bitcoin has one as um, uh, the value system of humanity, and all financial transactions, um, all economic activity happens on top of. Uh, the the Bitcoin value system. So whether that's you know an abstracted layers or whatever, it's happening on top of Bitcoin. Uh, to me, what that implies is that the Bitcoin market cap has to exceed the value of all the aggregate components that can be purchased with Bitcoin. Meaning that the the market capitalization of Bitcoin in hyper Bitcoinization. If I agreed with your nine hundred trillion dollar number, which I do think is maybe overly conservative. Uh, number, but the the uh, it should at least match the value of all assets that can be purchased with it. So, would do, would you agree with that 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 framing? I would not. I I don't think that's accurate. And I think that you know, look, we've seen this with you know prior years with uh, something like gold, right? Because at one point, gold was the reserve asset. It was the you know, it was kind of the the currency of the world. And gold was, at its peak, worth what the U.S. stock market is, was worth, right? That's what it was, at its peak. Now, um, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't fighting with real estate. So here you're getting already some of real estate's kind of market cap in this. But I, don't think, I, I just don't think that's right. I just don't think, I think the, 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 those yeah. numbers are not correct. That's basically, David. But I think... It doesn't really matter. I just don't think you're going to get to 100. Yeah. Th those numbers don't work. And just to, to give you a, a back-of-the-envelope number, why I don't think so, the U.S. debt is $34 trillion, right? That gives you a sense, right? That gives you a sense of kind of, you know, that the U.S. debt means $34 trillion. That means the U.S. bond market is $34 trillion, right? Because the, the U.S. government bond market, because it's, fu it's funded by the U.S. debt, right? So that's the reverse of it. So $34 trillion is, is, is the debt market. The stock market is less, right, than $30 trillion right now. You know, so, like the U.S. stock market. So, you know, you add all these things together and you have $300 trillion for real estate. It's not in the quadrillions. And, yes, there are derivatives of, of all that. But you're, you're double counting when you start adding those. Well, yeah. I, I guess my general my general yeah. view is that if if Bitcoin's going to be effectively the index fund of, of all things that can be acquired, then it, it's an aggregate of those pieces. And so, you know, it's it's the it's the overall category. I mean, the category that Bitcoin is, you know, is not crypto. The category is value. It is it is literally value. And so, you know, everything should be uh, every other asset category should fall uh within that broader category of value in, in in my opinion and you know there's two other things that you're leaving out of your equation which is one you know the the supply of bitcoin is not 21 million bitcoins there's bitcoin that have been lost there's bitcoin um uh, there's a lot of bitcoin that's been lost and so you know just like you have to basically fit the value of all these things that can be acquired in bitcoin in the supply of Bitcoin that's actually liquid and exists out there in the market. So that's one thing. Uh, and then the second thing is that I think that as this, this thesis plays out um, of hyper-Bitcoinization occurring, the real growth rate accelerates. 
And so over the time period that this is happening, you're going to have a higher growth rate that's going to ultimately increase the, the, the real purchasing power of Bitcoin. So um, I think there's a, a lot of different elements that if you, if you add up each of them individually, you can make a case for, okay, well, you know, half the Bitcoin supply is lost, so double whatever number you come out to. And then, you know, oh, we're going to have a higher, you know, growth rate that's going to take 15, 20 years to play out. Okay, well, that's two more doubles there. So, like, as, so as you start kind of laying it out, you could see a much higher number than 10 million. I mean, 10 million really only gets Bitcoin hey. to a fraction of world assets. Hey, Fred, can I, can I chime in here? Sure, Grant. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so, so folks, look, um, I like doing math in my head. And, Fred, I think your, your, um, your chart was great, your models, your math, awesome. But I'm just going to go beast mode right here. So, look, Bitcoin was $15,000 approximately, whatever, 15 months ago. So from 15000 to 60000 4 times 15 is 60000 If it then does a 6x from there and gets to 360000 in a year, I think it'll be less. You then have 4 times 6, which is a 24x. I was at Merrill Lynch because I have friends that's with them. They kind of pitch about a 7 to 10% a year in their funds. If anybody in this call does not understand the math that I just said, and you could buy an asset that was 15000 does a 4x to 60000 a 4 times 6 is 24, which only gets you to 360000 The math that Fred did is awesome, probably true somewhere there, but if you're not happy with a 24x of a return, and if you miss the first 4x and get a 6x in a year, do you really care about it, whether it's $10 million or whether it's $900 trillion, you don't. So please, somebody in this call, refute the math that I just said. I've been holding Bitcoin uh, since 10 <laughs> bucks. Uh, 10,000 X doesn't, doesn't get it done for me anymore. We got to go higher. Yeah, I was going to say, I think, uh, yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> but the reason why you said that is because the, bar is very you, because high the, amount, of, the, the amount that you have is an insignificant amount. If you need a thousand X to get to the point where you want to, or you need a hundred X, you didn't buy enough when it was low enough. Right. Well, yeah, I, mean, we're, we're, I don't we're, care. We're, not, I don't, we're not talking about making money here at this at this stage. When you're talking about Bitcoin, ten million, Bitcoin, one hundred million. Uh, I'm not. I'll be very clear. I'm here to make money, and then I will help the world. I am in this you're for the money. Right. Money too. I'm not. I'm. I'm here to make very clearly. Fred had a had a call last week. NGU number go up. All I care about number go up. If you made a 4X from 15,000 to 60,000, and then from 60,000 to 360,000, and you get a 24X, you go say that to any investment person, can you get me a 24X in two years? And they will laugh at you. So if this goes to a million, or if it goes to 10 million, right? And I think it probably will. Who cares what the dates are in that point? If I make in two, in two years, I make 24X. The math is so easy to do, folks. Please refute the simple math. Hey, Fred, this is Tom. Can you hear me? Yeah, can hear you. How's it going? So, uh, good. I, I, you know, I have. I, I believe it can easily get to the ten million. The issue is, what's that path look like? I mean, the the looking at all these models, whether it be stock to flow, or power law, or some of the Elliott wave stuff, they're helpful in terms of framing your thinking about where we've come from, where we are, and where we might be going. But none of these models are perfect. And, you know, and I, I did, when I studied a lot with listening to you having the conversation with Giovanni over the last week, you know, the, 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 the part of the example that, that resonated with me was the metabolic rate and the body mass and then showing that graph from a mouse to an elephant. And then the issue really became in the conversation, why don't we see animals beyond an elephant on that power curve is because there are other variables like skeletal structure uh, and that, that, that prevent further things happening. So if you were to change the skeletal structure of mammals to titanium or something like that, you would see animals on the power curve bigger. So to me, that says the power curve is accurate and it has boundary conditions. I think when you get into looking at the power curve to infinity, it doesn't make sense 
And it also doesn't feel like it's accurately going to predict the next two or three years because of the speed. Uh, when I looked at the power law and I said, Where is it, when are we going to get to 1 million? It felt too conservative to me. Now, Giovanni will say, well, you can see you know, multiples above that. You're going to see above and below. That might be true. So I, I allow for that to be the case. But when I think of what's happening with these ETFs, and I look at what happened yesterday, a lot of people call that a down day. That was just market whipsawing, clearing out levered longs and shorts. If you look at the liquidation map on coin glass, you know, it was almost predictable. They went up and killed the shorts and they went down, killed the longs. And now we're back to where we were. Uh, so that was just people, you know, the, the sophisticates taking over everyone's uh, Bitcoin, forcing them to buy and sell. And now they have a lot more. And you saw those inflows. It's crazy. So I think we're, 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 we've been approved politically to, I'll call it the store of value asset. BTC is now in the asset club, and you're going to see it roll into these portfolios. And that's going to take it to that million-dollar level pretty fast. The issue is, does it get to this cycle before we cycle down a little bit? Or is it, you know, that could be in a year? Or is it going to take three or four years? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And, and, and to uh, Grain of Salt's comment, at some level, I don't care. I care about it in the future when it gets there to decide whether or not I'm going to maybe roll back a little bit. But I'm probably not. You're not inclined to do that. The right, other right. So, so, need so, a, so, so, so look. Yeah. Look, look if, if this asset, you, you guys are thinking about what's going to happen in five or ten years. And, and that's a great mental model thought to go through that. And I appreciate that. And I've read all that now for, for, for the better part of seven years on crypto Twitter. My point is, if you have an asset... That's let's just say just does a two to four X every year. And the typical, if you go to any investment advisor, they won't even get you 10% a year. So it's already doing 10 X of what they're recommending. Right. So I'm just trying to tell you is that my point with this is keep the math simple in your head. You can have these discussions, but it's, it's number go up on the S curve, Fred, you know, I think your C input variable is a little bit too small. I think that it, it ramps up faster. And like you said on your analysis that, and when it hits a million, whether you change the uh, the C variable, it gets there. Sorry, when you compare it against the power law, it both gets there in the same time. So I don't know if people watched your your, your full video. The video was great. The end point yeah, is so, about the so same. I, the way I looked at it in, the, in in my video, right? I found that you know, and again, I've I've spent all of you know thirty minutes modeling this uh, S curve thing. But what I looked at, it, you can probably get there faster. You can get to a million faster, but it's going to take you longer to get to say ten million. I agree. Right? That's why it's not. It's right, not, and that's why I say yeah. it, it's an interesting conversation, folks. But let's realize right now we're at sixty-six thousand. Drop it back. Just say it's fifty thousand to make the math simple. But from fifty thousand to a million is a twenty x, and the twenty x from fifty thousand was then a triple before that. If you bought at, at fifteen thousand, so you do three times fifty, which means you got a hundred fifty x. So I just did the math in my head. Three times fifty is one hundred fifty x, and if you get there in two years or three years, nobody well, cares. I think another way, another thing you're saying, Grain, is look. Right now, the the next, let's just say the next ten x is pretty much in the bag right now. Correct. Right. Everybody, I think, I think you can see ten x in the bag. Right. The next ten x is going to be a lot more hard. I think. Okay. It's just going to, it, you know, you 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 you're coming into other things. This 10x you're going to get just because of passive portfolio allocations and people putting one two percent in their in their in their 401ks, uh, you know, with IBIT. That's it, right? To get to that next 10x, that's going to eight, number one. You're going to get all these people selling. You will get people selling, right? Because you know, once you get from a million, you are going to get people. I, selling, I will be right? one of those people. And so what we're, ta we're, yeah, right, so what we're talking about is. From from here to one million is accumulation phase, and above one million becomes diminishing returns, but the number still goes up. Again, at that point, folks, if you miss this cycle, yeah, well, I, I, think I, think, I, I think what the debate is that's happening here is that are are the re, the returns really diminishing? And I think that that's like a pretty big. I don't think we're there. Pretty yet. big. Intellectual I don't concept. think we're there yet, personally. I mean, I think I think it, I think look, I th I agree with what 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 Fred's saying. Like, I think. I think it gets a little shaky after five, six hundred K personally. I mean, again, this is just like my opinion, but, um, and I think that, yeah, getting beyond, it's going to get toppy and shaky and it's going to get volatile 
and it may not hit a million in this bull run. I, I think David had, I think it was David had an interesting point there earlier, which is, you know, maybe the peak actually gets a little moderated. I mean, if we see a lot of past, if we see a lot of um, institutions buying the ETFs and we see auto rebalancing as it goes up, it's possible you get a little moderation on the upside too. So I, I don't know. I think it, I think it's interesting to see. And, you know, I agree with Grant Assal too. I mean, the reality is the return has always been insane with Bitcoin and will continue to be because it's, you know, the emergence of the finance. It, 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 it has always been insane, but now we're about to see this hit a mainstream finance, yeah. right? Agreed. This has always been insane, but it's always been sort of insane and, and the sort of fra weird, right. or, you know, uh, place. And now the average CNBC person is going to start looking at Gompert's uh, curves and power laws, and they're going to bring Fred into... Uh, you're going to see me with the Joe Kerner, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of where so, we're headed, right? Because so they, they got to figure out. I, I'm looking at total inflows right now to the ETF since they've launched uh, net inflows of $8.5 billion. If, if that's wrong, someone correct me. Um, we've gone from thirty. We've gone from forty thousand dollars to um, seventy thousand dollars. So we've added, let's call it five hundred, six hundred billion dollars in market capitalization off of eight and a half billion dollars of net inflows. Eight and a half billion dollars is nothing. It's nothing. So you know, I, I when I when I try to come up with the mental model for what this cycle looks like, which I typically, if you would ask me even three months ago, what do I think the peak of this, this cycle looks like? I would have given you a much lower number. But when I look at, hey, eight and a half billion dollars over 60 days pumps the Bitcoin price 100%, well, shit, I could see us getting to, to $10 billion of inflows coming into this thing a day. Right, but I think so, the other thing, David, though, if using that same those same numbers, right, I think you have to throw away the idea of cycles. Okay, because you know the the reality is you have ten billion dollars a day coming in. The having no longer matters. Okay, it really doesn't. I'm right, sorry. No, I, I agree. I mean, this is the question: is what what does what does the pattern look like going forward? I, I think it's going to be different. I, I'm totally with. You. I think I think it it would be interesting, uh, Fred, for your co-host time on CNBC is to also have run some models on virus spread. Because this is, uh, we're at the well, point that is where we've the, gone past This model is a viral model. Oh, is the S-curve? Yeah, this S-curve oh, This S -curve stuff is for like like literally cancerous tumors, okay? Right. This, this is how, so, it's right. literally so, how they grow. So, so, so look, let me, guys, so you just said something very interesting. So um, it was uh, David speaking, I believe. So look, Bitcoin was about $32,000 on October 25th. So you've got December, January, February, March, and four months it did a double. If it pulls another double, that's a 4X, I don't know, pick two months out. you got a 4X in whatever, a 4X in, in six months, right? So you got a double, double right there. And then, so that's a 4X, and that would get it to 120,000. You only need a 3X there. So if you multiply that out, then you have a 12X, again, done in a year or a year and a half from now, I think everybody's missing, missing the big picture of where this ends up and whether it's a, a virus model or a Gumpert curve or a Gaussian curve or an S curve. Those numbers on Wall Street, they, Jim Cramer does not understand it and he thinks Michael Saylor is a joke. So I, if you guys aren't happy with the 12 well, not only, not only, hey, so not, Grain, not only, to your earlier point, right, not only that Jim Cramer doesn't understand it, but all these investment advisors, they're sitting around with these models and they're like, we, we're not sure whether it's 7% a year or 9% a year, right? Like, that, those are the kind of things. They don't have a, there's not even a room in their spreadsheets for 100% a year. There's not, that doesn't exist, right? They, and exactly, all the they, actuaries they, they and everybody even, else. Right, they can't calculate that, guys. And, and by the way, I'll just go back for a second because I was going back on this. Uh, I see that uh, uh, Ryan's on the call. Look, um, I was an early investor in GBTC. In January of... 2018, GBTC had a 91 for one split. Okay, so this is not like I haven't been through a 10x jump when that happened. And I bought, you know, within, you know, uh, uh, sorry, almost a 100x jump. So a 100x, if you talk to somebody about that, and it's at an all time high, 
So if you guys haven't seen a 100x jump in, in, in a stock split in your career, so be it. But I lived through that, and there's other people on this call that I know that have lived through that also. We're quite happy with a 100x jump. Again, so keep the math simple in your head. Read what Fred says. We can argue about whether it's going to 1 or 10 million when diminishing returns sits in. But if you're making 5 or 10x in a year, you're good. Green, if you think about what you said, the envelope math, I, I very much like that because as people sitting there and they're going to their jobs, they're working, they're making, they're living their life, you have this, when can I retire perspective around your financial wealth? And you could say it's a 5% rule on your portfolio. Can I live on 5% uh, and, 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 and last it out? The, the, the alg if, if we get into a sustained mode where this asset class is having much, much higher annual rate of returns as it has in the past, it changes the algebra of your financial freedom. And what I think what people are going to start wanting to learn how to adopt this and think about it is how long will this last? So when we talk about it going from here to a million, that's, that's fucking great. But I mean, does it go beyond that? And, and, and that's, a, that's right now to me is a question mark how that happens. But to, for, from here to a million is a, you know, not quite a 20x, but it's a, you know, 16, 17x from here. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for getting it. So folks, I'll give you some insight. This is the second time I'm going to retire. And I'm going to tell you why. When I retired in, in, in 2021, it was pretty lonely. So what I, what I had to do was I had to get my friends rich enough because I'm in my mid-50s and they all had jobs. And so what I told them was, you're going to retire with me. So I went back to work for a year and a half. I'm going to quit on or about sometime in the next week or two for my second retirement. And the reason why this time my retirement will work out is because I have a bunch of friends I can now hang out that are the same age as me that we can go do stuff together. And so that's exactly right. And so I just want you to know, if you think, oh my God, you get this huge number and I have all these people to hang out with and they all have regular jobs and they're like, why don't you ever have to work? Why don't you ever have a job again? It's because I did the work. I did the research. I understood basic multiples. <laughs> They're missing that. So when you do that, when, when you're when you're hanging out in a castle by yourself, it it, it sounds kind of cool, and you got a Ferrari, but if there's no one to share it with, it kind of sucks. And it's a really good problem to have. And that's why if you can't think about this, if you're going to talk about viral things and regression curves and S curves, I like the hockey stick approach or Metcalf's law, n times n minus one over two. If you get that, but these other people don't get it. Then what's happening is it'll be a little bit lonely, and then you only have friends to hang out with on weekends, but they're busy with their family because they worked all week. So I want you guys to hear from my. So experience. I'm going to start a I'm going to start a dating service for uh, rich uh, Bitcoin whales. Uh, I, I think I think basically there's going to be a lot of them out there, and uh, you know I need to go find some gold diggers to go uh, dig dig into you guys' gold. Uh. <laughs> So, so uh, on the on the topic of approaching one million dollars of Bitcoin, I'm curious to hear the thoughts on like how much cash would need to come in over the next, you know, ninety days or this calendar year in order to take us to that price. Because I'm of the view that it's a lot smaller number than people think. Like I think if a hundred billion tried to come in over the next ninety days. We're going to a million bucks. Yeah, I think two hundred billion. I think, but I'm with I think it's somewhere between a hundred and a hundred and fifty billion dollars, based on all the multiples that are going on. I mean, there was a there was a time where it looked like the multiple was approaching, like two hundred to one, uh, over a three or four day window. And it, it, so yeah, it's as David, I think you're absolutely right. It's it's a very very small amount of capital. Uh, well, if you if you look at the inflows that are coming in right now, and you take grayscale and you zero grayscale out where it's not negating the inflows into the other nine ETFs, um, we're pacing at a billion dollars a day in inflows. So we're pacing for $100 billion to come in over the next 90 days. And I actually think that as we keep hitting new all-time highs, these numbers are going to keep accelerating. So we could have two, three, four, five billion dollar inflow days. Um, I think we're going to hit hundred billion dollars really quick. I, I think you're I think you're right. Like that's one of the reasons why I've been educated and entertained with with Fred's analysis of all the different price models that he's been looking at. But for for me personally, maybe I'm too stupid. Uh, but for me personally, the thing that I like looking at is the trend of cash flows and, and just looking at the 
the, you know, the growth factor on those. So I, I'm a hundred percent with your thinking of what, what Grain's saying as well. Like you've really got to, I think there's going to be a, a crossover here between the models that, um, are showing up here. And I think this S curve is going to be a, a combo of a bunch of them. So yeah, I think we could supersede anything and then everything else comes back into, into alignment. Hey guys, 100%. And I would just add to what Grain was saying about the, the S curve dynamics. Like, we're going to hit a million, but a million is not halfway through. I don't even think 10 or 20 million is halfway through. So, when we're looking at the decision of, hey, are we doing diminishing returns? Okay, no, we agree. We're not diminishing returns. But we've been doing diminishing returns for three cycles, which is 12 years. We're, we're about to change that. And I don't think it's just like, hey, this cycle will break diminishing returns. I think the next three cycles will be incredibly ramping you know cycle upon the next cycle so 12 years of increasing x's so you definitely make a great I point then them. about the you know like this uh mantra of the oh the cycles are diminishing because i definitely feel like this one's going to be more like a 2017 cycle and that's going to mm -hmm. uh that's going to throw kind of that model a little bit out of the window I agree. I think we're just we're just going to take a little baby step up the S curve, and we're going to be at a million per Bitcoin. And and a lot of people are going to sell on their way to a million, and that's going to be a huge mistake. The, the, I mean, sell for your lifestyle, but the prior, don't, don't the prior cycles, sell out for fiat. The prior cycles were all around the happenings, and given the the amount of demand that's going on is dwarfing that, and the happenings becoming less relevant, the the. I, I think the cycles become less relevant as you look in the past. I don't think the future looks like that. I think the, the halvening will become relevant again once you reach some, some element of capital saturation of Bitcoin as a significant portion of world assets. And at that point, the halvenings will, will become more relevant. But up until then, yeah, I think everyone, what you guys are saying is right. I'd like to make a note. If, if you 20x, the, if you 20x the, the price of Bitcoin, the amount of inflation being created per day for mining is substantial. And then you do that every day for a thousand days straight in a row, and the number is astronomical. So that the, the halving definitely has a massive material impact on how high we go. Um, but I, it's, it's not a relevant number today. It just becomes a relevant number once we find whatever the, the top top is you know one of the things i love about fred and he's doing a great job on his models i believe but if you listen to fred you know he's willing to break his own models because nobody here exactly knows how this plays out and you know whether you're looking at a model whether it's power law um Gomez, or you're looking at cash flow flat earthers, right? I mean, uh, because we didn't have the technology or the knowledge to At least for me, you're coming in and out. Uh, yeah, he's cutting out. So... How am I now? Now you're better. So, okay. So, so, you know, to me, it's very akin to like, uh, the third century where everybody was flat, flat earthers. And so if you look at a linear chart of Bitcoin, it's a mess. And to the average person, the average person looking at Bitcoin, it's volatile, it's crazy, it's, um, it's hard to really, really understand and grasp. I mean, everybody here has spent hundreds of hours of studying this asset. And uh, whether it's British HODL and his multiplier effect and uh, cash flow uh, modeling or it's uh, power law, the, these help sort of uh, frame the issue for us and uh, really sink our teeth into it. And so, like, when, they, when you look at a log, uh, just a log, log rate of the chart of uh, Bitcoin, it starts to make more sense. It's like you get into the 10th or 11th or 12th century where some people started to believe the earth is round. Like we had Newton, the way the shadows were falling off the uh, uh, um, uh, the moon. He was like, hey, the way these shadows are falling, falling off the moon, it doesn't, it wouldn't be happening if the earth was flat. And then you had, you know, the Romans and the Greeks, the great intellectual thinkers, you know, noticing things like, hey, as the ships come in, 
why are we only seeing the tip of the cells first and not the whole ship if the Earth is flat? And so that, that's the log, you know, the log grid the chart of Bitcoin is, you know, you're looking at it, you're like, okay, it's starting to make sense. Maybe it's not flat, maybe it's round, but still most of society still believed Earth was flat, even in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century, though data started to come out that, hey, this thing makes sense. And it wasn't until the 15th century that it started to become, uh, you know, the consensus that the Earth was indeed round. But now what we have, right, is we have, um, we have, uh, we have physical, you know, t shots and pictures from, from space on, you know, the, the circumference of our Earth, right? And it's clearly round. So now we have like this, like, you know, imprinted vision of what the Earth looks like, and it's clearly around. And to me, that's what the power law kind of helps. With. Look, these laws, these laws are you know, helpful. But, just to give you a little bit of conviction that, like, nor a normal yeah. asset, right? Normally, if if I'm up ten x on an asset, I sell. Okay, if, if, that's, that's, that's kind of what I do, you know. And I've been, I've, I've had, I've had so many cases of that where I've just up ten x and I sell. I, just, I don't even think. I just sell. Okay. The only reason now I, I, I wouldn't sell is because I do think that it's going quite a bit higher than, you know, where I got, which is 10x down. From hey, so, so Fred, agree. So, so let me, let me, I'll tell you folks where the crossover path occurs for people. Okay. So we could talk about all these formulas and theories and I have friends that have M MBAs and engineering degrees. None of that matters. What matters is, is when you make your, your total yearly compensation in one day. Once that happens to somebody in their accounts and they log in and see that, then the disbelief and the belief will shift over very quickly. Somebody makes $20,000 a year, they've acquired enough Bitcoin, and then in one day they make, have a $20,000 gain in it. That's when all of a sudden they're like, holy crap, my life changed forever. And when you, when you have a, a, a seven-figure day, okay, that's when your mind gets blown. And, so what I'm, and then when you have multiples of that. So even very rich people, when they see that happen, it doesn't matter what the models say. And so that's why I do the mental math. But when I tell somebody, you can make your yearly salary and total compensation in one day by buying something and doing nothing, you hodl and you do that. You should have done that at 15,000 a year and 15 months ago, and then you'd be up 4X. So the models don't matter to people with even advanced degrees and PhDs until they see that happen. That's that's the point. But you know what? Like Dave Portney, Portnoy, right? He's the best example of the... He, of, yeah, but he's complaining. He's but you know what he should do? do? He should just buy Bitcoin right now instead of complaining. I, I don't understand. All he's doing is sitting there and complaining instead of actually buying Bitcoin. Like, because he mofooed. money. He should he, buy Bitcoin. What an he idiot. He, find out right, he mofooed. M-O-F-U. He missed out. He was in it. The Winklevi twin came to his house in the Hamptons. They went off on something. Hey, let me tell you, Elon Musk is going to mine gold on, on the asteroid belt. And I'm like, oh my God, I cringed when they said that. They messed him up. He smashed bought a million bucks. And then he screwed up, sold it at the bottom because when everything, when the FTX thing blew up, and then he comes on and admits, I log in to see what's going. And by the way, David Portnoy made a major mistake. He never uh, looked in to book that loss on his taxes. And I didn't tell him about that, but he never, he goes, he never looked in after that year happened. And that was a realized loss that he could have taken for that year. So he didn't even take care of his tax liability, folks. And that's David Portnoy. I, well, I, don't that's, really, I mean, I think one of the, the he things screwed is, up. I think one of the things is some of us who've been in the space for a while and who didn't like David uh, Bailey. Buy Bitcoin at ten dollars. I, I I never saw it at ten, but I bought it at a hundred uh, two hundred back in twenty thirteen, just a little bit, and I sold it and whatever. Right, I got cute, right? But you know, the hard thing is realizing that you were wrong, right? Realizing that maybe your mental model was not correct, right? And uh, you know, you with Bitcoin, you you don't have that many chances to do this. You know, but uh, there's a lot of people who they just go to, oh, I missed it, right? I missed it. I missed buying Bitcoin. At, there's still people right now that are like, I missed buying Bitcoin at 30,000, 35,000, 38,000 in back, you know, back in uh, January, right? They missed it. So they're not going to get involved. 
that is the biggest mistake you can make right now in Bitcoin is looking at this thing going, I missed it. But that said, there's nothing that shows any more of a lack of understanding than having that mentality because you assume that all the gains that there were to be had have already been had and you've, you've missed it. It's now kind of where it's at. And the people who think like that, right, they don't, they have a really, I think, a massively hard time comprehending Bitcoin at, you know, 600,000 or 2 million and beyond. And that, you know, it's, it's, I dealt with this with a buddy recently, right? He like engaged and said, oh, I want to, you know what, I'm capitulate. You've been telling me to buy it since it was a thousand. I'll do it now. Send me some, send me some stuff to get my knowledge up. I do a day later. He's like, yeah, you know what? I did a little bit of researching. It's going back to 18, 19,000. I'll buy when it dips there. Cause that's what happened last time and it really is just an ego test for people and uh those people who keep failing that will end up buying when it's half a million because that's what everybody's doing and then they'll brag about how they doubled their money when it goes to a million i'm gonna hop just for a second i'm gonna leave the space on so alessandro can uh, invite people to be speakers he's co-host uh, but i'll be back in 10 15 minutes okay thanks fred hi all yeah and i gotta bounce too uh thanks for the space ciao Thanks, David. So uh, Dallas, I, I agree with you. And I think there are um, two ways for people to understand that, that they need to hold. One is going through a one full cycle because every, each of us, uh, they started, then they, as Fred said, you sell at uh, 200%, 300%, 500%. And the second would be the hardest way. It would be to study Bitcoin. Uh, someone was saying also, we, all of us studied uh, hundreds of, of hours. And uh, this is what is required to see Bitcoin with a new lens. Everyone else is looking at Bitcoin with the lens of stocks, of locks, of traders. And this is normal that uh, at one point uh, they will be selling. Some will not buy now. will buy maybe after uh, 100K. And I think in the first cycle, it will be very hard for them to not to sell with 100, 200%. Back to, back to 1 million, I think for sure there should not be, there's not even a question of selling Bitcoin from here to 1 million. It's, it's a clear path. On the multiplier, uh, British, you were saying uh, um, maybe I would say I will be a bit more conservative and say to reach one million, it means that we should have uh, 20 million market cap. And maybe we can consider like uh, 80 as a multiplier and we need uh, 250,000, um, 250 billion dollars inflow. Maybe we that, that makes year, maybe next that, year. that makes absolute sense in a bear market. Right, the, the bear market yes. multiples currently are reaching those 55 to 80 levels. We're about to enter a bull market, and the bull market multiple for the last cycle was 118 at the peak. Like, we are, we are going to so far exceed that it's going to blow people's entire little brains when we start seeing 200 to 1 multipliers, but I believe that's what's coming. 200 as a multiplier, okay. That's, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, even assuming uh, 100 or 80, it's Think, billion. Alessandro, think bigger. Don't be afraid of okay. thinking bigger. <laughs> yeah, we, if it is uh, 200, it's 100 billion. And as, as we were saying uh, yesterday, the nine in flow was 980 million. The day before, 950. Yeah. We're not even, we haven't even started yet. We haven't even started <laughs> yet. The RIA is not, are not even advising yeah. people to get into Bitcoin yet. The, the, we, we haven't even hit FOMO yet. This time we're going to get FOMO from retail and from institutions. Oh, no. This time we're going to get FOMO from people who are sitting there who have got boats, right? And they're going to go, fuck this. I'm going to sell this boat and put it into Bitcoin. You know, you're not going to get it from people like who are going to sell, who are going to sell their damn iPhone, right? Like this is a whole different market that you're talking about. You need to think bigger, Alessandro. <laughs> It's hard for me because I, to, speaking with anyone else, I'm the bullish guy. I say 250, 300k, but there is always someone more bullish than you. But we have, like <laughs> Fred is, Fred is, Fred has pointed out really well, right? And again, the the, the models, like all of the models, are, are are useful to me. I don't take any of them seriously at all. Um, I, especially the the power law one made the least sense to me because I don't believe in diminishing returns when you're going through an S curve of adoption with capital everywhere in the world. But just think about this, Alessandro. You've got one asset everywhere in the damn world. It's the same asset in New York. It's the same asset in London. It's the same asset in Singapore. It's the same asset in Dubai. It has the same supply. It's not like real estate. It's not like anything else. So yes, we can absolutely. These these Qatari states and all this other shit that people are talking about, even if they just go, okay, we're going to buy $50 million a day worth of Bitcoin. That's adding uh, $80,000 a day to the equilibrium price. That's just one country. 
So you need to think bigger. This is this is this is the first time this has ever happened. That's why people are finding it hard to figure out what's going to happen. That's why people are finding it hard to model this thing because it's never happened before. British, let's talk about that one eighteen multiple. I know you've written a lot about that on your in your feed. That that was the 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 last bull calculation done. You know, in the last cycle, and it was done relative to supply demand characteristics and. Uh, you know, all of that based on the last uh, cycle. The, the demand and supply characteristics are going to be very different this time, which means that multiple is going to change. And I think you alluded to that. Can you talk a little bit about what you, how high you think that multiple goes? Because I do think it goes above 118 in the, when it gets heated, and we're not heated yet. Yeah. Yeah, we're not even we're not even warm yet. We we're like the frog isn't even nervous yet, right? Like we're, we're it's still sitting in a pan, very very comfortable. Like this is the first time. Like this is the least exciting that uh, we've seen a sixty eight thousand, sixty nine thousand dollar Bitcoin ever in history. We have not started yet. I think this I think this multiplier at the peak of this cycle is above two hundred, uh, and the FOMO is going to be absolutely ridiculous. Now, does that mean that we're probably going to see another correction? Sure. But I don't know how deep that correction is going to go because I still think there's going to be passive flows coming in. We'll see. But I think well, 200. I, okay, I, I agree that we will not see big corrections because uh, if the ETF are keeping buying, they will also prevent maybe not the full correction, but the portion of the of the correction. So did anybody on the, did anybody on this space buy yesterday on the dip? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I did as well. At least my hey, company, just, just, yeah, the company's all in. Guy, full I, I didn't buy in the dip because there's no more money left to buy in. <laughs> it, it, it's that there is no more money left to yeah. buy, and I don't do any options or calls or anything. You're not the no only money one. left. <laughs> like uh, with which money? <laughs> it, it, exactly, folks. So that that that's the conviction right there. And and, and again. We could talk about these models. When you go talk to somebody else, and I've talked to people with PhDs in math, they just don't get it. And and if you explain to them, you can actually look up the Fred balance sheet Wednesday level. Look at that. You can look at M2. As soon as you start talking macroeconomics, and that's what my degree is in, their eyes glaze over and they're like, really? Could you just give me the price target? And it doesn't, you know, in this next cycle, nobody wants to talk to me anymore. I'm not going to bring this up. It, it, you guys don't have to realize when somebody comes and sees this and, and, and the worst thing that you could say to them at a party a year and a half or two years from now, and you show up in your car and you you don't have a job anymore. And somebody's like, Hey, how'd you do it? You, you, you're not going to want to say the B word because they're going to know that they mo food. They're going to know it and they're going to make it. They're going to make an assumption of your intelligence of why you were able to do that. And it's not about intelligence. It's about the hard work to, to read what's going on and understand that. That's what's going to happen. Mark my words. This will happen in two years to the people on this call. You'll be at a party and somebody's like, wow, you're doing really well. That doesn't make any sense. And you're not going to want to say that B word. You're just not. It's not going to go well for you because they're going to, what happens is they'll realize their mistake. Now, Green, <laughs> it's, it's a normalcy bias that's wired into us where we say it's too good to be true. And if you don't plow through the work to get past that too good to be true bias that we all have, uh, it's understandable. I feel, I, I actually, I, I, I've already experienced that, you know, that social issue. And so I just don't like to even talk about it with people unless they bring it up and it's in a private conversation. You know, look, folks, same, I, same, I know, yeah, I know same guy, for me. On. Yeah, same yep. thing. So I know a guy... I can't say who it is. And and two weeks ago, he was having a party at his house, and somebody said to him, "You don't still have that that fake internet money." And he looked over at him and said, "Do you want your scotch neater with it with a with an ice cube in it?" And this was a guy that was at his house, and and you look at the house, you're like, "Oh my god, can you believe that?" And that that was two weeks ago. So again. Folks, this will be life changing. But what I'll tell you is that you will lose thirty percent of your friends, if not more. Okay, and that's a good thing. You guys did the work. You're on the call. You're listening. If you guys think I'm overpowering, it's because you're late. I don't want you guys to think that you're early. The halving's coming. We've never, as British Hoddle said, we've never had an all-time high before a halving, and we're not even warmed up yet. 
I, I think it's also. I, I think advice. it's. I think it's also important to mention the fact, Alessandro, is that. We're doing this right now. All of this price action is in a monetary contraction period. We have not, we're not in a loose money period yet. And that's about to start. We're about to start lowering interest rates. We're about to start printing money to try and change the weather. We're about to start doing all these things, right? And then on top of that, we've got the options markets coming out soon. The options markets could trade five times the volume that the underlying spot markets are, are doing. There is just so much demand here for coming. The problem is, is that normal people don't understand how the engine of the financial markets work. So they can't perceive that there could be $200 billion worth of sudden demand that shows up in a year. But I'm telling you, it's more, not only real, it's coming. It's all lined up. But the fact that we've done $8 billion in the first seven, uh, you know, the first seven weeks on these ETFs, what, what do you think would have happened if we had options on this? This would have been a $40 billion uh, forty billion dollars of inflows into into these markets in the first seven weeks, and that's absolutely phenomenal. So, contractionary markets. We've been doing dealing with contractionary financial uh, circumstances. We're about to turn expansionary, and we got options coming out, and we got boomers that have boats and cars and houses that they don't need. Like the amount of FOMO that's about to turn on with this. It, it, we can't measure it. And Grain of Salt is absolutely right. That's why with every single time I speak, I want to inject some fucking adrenaline inside of you and urgency for people to actually get uh, get their holdings because everyone's screwing around looking at price models trying to predict all this shit. You're going to you're gonna waste your time and you're not going to own enough Bitcoin. The goal is owning enough of the monetary network. Everything else we can assess later. British, how much is the yes. Rolex worth that you sold? Sorry, say that again? You sold your Rolex and bought Bitcoin. How much is it worth now? Uh, I, I sold a bunch of Rolexes. The one that I talk about it's, was 1.36 Bitcoin. Nice. You, you know what this uh, little segment reminds me of is that one of my best, uh, one, one of my favorite Michael Saylor uh, edited pieces that I think we've all seen on X is the one where he, before every time he gives a, a new, uh, you know, interview you see the big size out of them like like you know this big deep size like how many times do i have to tell you all you idiots this is the greatest asset in human history it's the it's best the, asset that's so, so hey, I, 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 I want to go back with british house look guys the 10-year the note right right now is that is a little bit over four percent and a 30-year fixed rate in america is seven percent this is not a loose cycle and all i ever heard was ah oh, the fred the if if for some reason the money printer go burr was supposed to be, um, I'm going to use a term here, it was monetary debasement. Inflation and monetary debasement are two different things. And some of the you're splitting hairs playing semantics. No, you could print a lot of money and you don't have high inflation. And that would be 2008. Okay, a lot of monetary printing, but not a lot of inflation. Okay, so with, with that said, people, people don't, they just don't get this. The, the, the grain of salt. Yeah. Speak to yeah, that. No, the monetary, just just to be clear on this, the, the monetary situation is actually incredibly loose by several metrics, and you can go through this, and you can make the argument that Lynn Alden and others make repeatedly that the high interest rate environment is actually injecting liquidity, and the fiscal dominance is causing it to be an extremely loose environment. So, just I'm not saying that's a bearish thing for Bitcoin. Joe, actually, where are interest rates right now? It, 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 it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It, it's not a question of the interest rate. It's a question of what is it relative to inflation. That's right. It's real rates. Real rates are what matter. Um, yeah, so, so, so Joe, look, I, I can argue that, but we've been in this inverted, the, the inverted yield curve. Which is bullish, that. right? That's a bullish indicator. It, 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 when, the invert, uh, when the yield curve uninverts is the bearish indicator. So historically, just... Right, but hold on, hold on to that narrative. All I've been hearing about, this is the longest inverted yield curve ever without a recession. And I posted, we had a golden cross on the S&P 500 in February of last year. And either you believe in a golden cross where the 50-day cross is a 200-day moving average, or you don't. And I posted about that. And I also said, how many days after a golden cross do you think it's bullish? Tom Lee for Fundstrat was the only guy that was right, that got it right on the S&P 500 for last year. And everybody's like, in, the inevitable inflation is going to, sorry, in, the inevitable recession is going to happen and we're all screwed. And that mainstream media bullshit on CNBC costs people a 4X. I agree with you totally. And this is, what I'm saying is not a bearish thing. I think it's actually bullish. But I think, I think financial conditions are incredibly loose by some metrics. Um, now, my friend, Dr. Jeff, he's right, correct. Right, but what you're saying there is... Liquidity.
go ahead. But what you're saying there is, confu- is confusing to people. We could argue that part, but let's go back to British Hoddle. You're late. He is right. Let's get some passion. And look, if you thought you were early because it's before the halving, nah, you're really late by about a year. And so you need to figure out what you could sell. Don't take it. I don't tell anybody to buy on margin or borrow money or HELOC loans. I don't tell anybody to do that. But you've got to realize whatever your allocation is going to be in this is to have that done yeah, well, by today. Well, grain of salt, what you but just said the, is really important because – there's a lot of people on this call who, like, I think it was like yourself, right, who said, I don't have any more cash, right? So what is the natural reaction? The natural reaction is they make themselves, I think, more vulnerable because they go and try to get sources of liquidity that aren't really at their disposal. They're borrowing. Their mar- I mean, I know kids who got absolutely wrecked, kids that got wrecked by Bitcoin. They bought Bitcoin with student loans in 2017, convinced it was going to $50,000 and, and Wall Street was here. Um, okay, they they lo- they then had to panic sell in 2018, and they had student loans on the hook that they are non dischargeable in debt. Like that, literally, I could give you their names. Um, so, like, to, absolutely, you should have a priority. And everything British does is fantastic about like get to one, right? All these things are awesome. I don't I don't disagree with any of that. But but don't get over your skis because that's almost in my in my view that's even worse. I totally, totally agree should be. I to, hey, totally agree with that. And, and I use a line when I talk to people. This is an ism that I have. I treat people like adults, and you know what? Maybe that's a good learning example for what they had to do. Some people get. Sometimes it's better to have a good learning example early in your life than later in your life, and maybe that will make them to understand to do the homework on this. And so maybe that's maybe that's the inflection point for those people. And I, I, yeah, it, yes, it, it hurts me to hear that, but yeah. I think that's true. But again, there comes a point where you have to take responsibility for your own actions on the upside and the downside. Right. And if you are in a high net worth yeah. individual, if you've got access to, 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 to margin, if you're comfortable with those instruments, you're in a totally different situation, right? But we're in a room here with 1,200 people, and I would wager that the vast majority of the people uh, are thinking, well, how do I get more Bitcoin? I don't have any more cash. I, I think I many, agree. they still have. I, I, I agree. Folks, I'll say, it when, I'll say it on the call, and please quote me. Do not borrow money to buy Bitcoin if you haven't done, if you just, just don't borrow money to buy Bitcoin. It's oh, not it's a good idea. idea. I agree. But I think most of the people here in um, 1,200, uh, they are not 100% in Bitcoin. So in case there are 5 or 10%, my recommendation is uh, study Bitcoin. And the more you study, the more you allocate. Uh, I also, I think as every Bitcoiner, once you understand Bitcoin, after hundreds, hundreds of hours of study, you say, okay, I need to tell this to everyone. And then you start to get pushbacks. And then you say, okay, maybe... It's better if I don't push that much, but I make them aware that I'm in, in the Bitcoin and um, they will come to me in case it's needed. My narrative before it was study Bitcoin, now change, and it is uh, study Bitcoin and do it quickly. The more you study, because uh, the train is uh, about to leave. And uh, if they don't have conviction, I, I would not recommend to put so much in, into Bitcoin because uh, as we seen yesterday, for us, okay, we saw minus 8K, and it's okay, it's part of Bitcoin, but imagine someone who is into stocks, bond, or real estate. The price is going down 8K in one day. It will be shocking. So conviction should be always at first for me. Yeah, and you know why it goes down 8K? It goes down 8K because of degenerates with leverage. That's just the reality. It's not It's not actually because a bunch of hodlers decided, oh, we're all going to dump. Yeah, you know, that totally. one miner who dumped totally. for at the top, but the majority of people get liquidated because they're playing with money they don't have. Yes, uh, f- uh, bet for them. And uh, but that's but that's we, but that's that's the function of the market, right? And Joe knows this, right? That's the function of the market, and that's what needs to happen. We've got a bio rotation going on here with Bitcoin. The people that own Bitcoin after those people get wrecked are never ever going to sell because they don't need to sell. They don't yeah, need yeah, to generate not, liquidity. British, I'm not passing judgment on it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing or you should remove leverage or you should ban it. I believe in the free market. My, my point is that if you're talking to people, regular people, and they say, how, you know, and there's these, these fools on, on Twitter who are saying, that's why it's not a store of value because it declines uh, you know, $8,000 in 20 minutes. The reason that does that is because in a free market, you have people doing stupid things and they're getting taken to the woodshed. And that's how it's supposed to work. It's the opposite of our current system where everyone gets a bailout when for taking risky bets in the banks and everyone else gets, you know, gets the government to backstop them. In, our, in this system, which is truly open and global, you have people playing with money they don't have and they lose 
their Bitcoin and they will have to pay a horrible price years down the line thinking, oh, I was so smart. I was going to lever this Bitcoin when it's life changing money they could have just had by holding. Joe, there's a bunch of leverage sitting right below 69 right now. Uh, that, that my guess will be liquidated by the end of the day. Yes, I agree. Also, seeing the volume uh, of the of the nine, maybe we will have already the first day with the uh, one billion inflow um, by the end of the day. So yeah, we'll, and but also the liquidation should be less. We touched it yesterday and we went down eight k. So maybe a lot of leverage is already liquidated. I, I think we're also look. I, this is gonna this is gonna come across as me sounding like an arsehole, which is a completely new territory for me, right? But. I, I think we are approaching a, a, a period where, you know, the message to the general public, we're all going to have to accept it, even though we all want to be liked and loved by people that are listening, that some people, you've just missed the boat. Like, you have just missed the boat. You should have worked harder. You should have got more Bitcoin. Well, so where, British, what does that mean? What, what, what price they've missed the damn they, boat. I'm talking about to getting to a point to get to a point where you have enough Bitcoin that's going to make a real difference in your life. I I settled on one Bitcoin because that's what I think it's going to be. Right? You got your number. Everyone else has their number. But I don't think like you know it's sitting in a room going like I agree with you to a certain point where we shouldn't be saying get Bitcoin at any cost because if you can't get to one Bitcoin. And you're going into all this debt and debt and leverage and you don't know how to manage it, you might end up screwing yourself. I agree with you on that. I just think we gotta get to the point and be comfortable enough now to say some people have probably just missed the opportunity to make that sizable difference in their life that grain of salt is talking about. Yeah, so what level is that at for folks? I think it's that? one Bitcoin. I think it's one Bitcoin minimum. I think it's one Bitcoin minimum at these levels. And, and soon the window will be closed for even the medium class when it is 100, 150. Yeah, what are you going to okay, 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 do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when a Bitcoin's 100,000 and someone with a $2 million net worth doesn't have the free liquidity to buy that? So, so let's go through the math here, okay? So if you are somebody right now, okay, who can get your hands on half a Bitcoin, you guys in this room were just a few minutes ago going on and on about how a million's a lot and how it's coming in the short term. Well, I can tell you that if you get your hands on half a Bitcoin and Bitcoin's at a million dollars, it's $500,000, you have more retirement savings than 80, 86% of the population currently. So you, you've instantly moved yourself into the top quartile with that that half a Bitcoin. So I, I think even even lower Joe, now, now what you're doing is you're trying... Uh, FMT, could you mute up, please? Now what you're doing, Joe, is basically trying to get people to accept um that you know less is less is good and i'm not saying less is bad right if you can you should get as much bitcoin as you can but i think you know no, I, i'm just making you think about think about this conversation no i'm trying to make now, you think when, about injecting adrenaline into your veins because it sounds like you need some I'm, fucking I'm, adrenaline i'm i'm, I'm irresponsibly long bitcoin okay I, i'm just telling you for for regular people you're going to be talking in a room when a bitcoin's two hundred thousand dollars a year from now and they're going to say oh i missed the boat it's late british says i i, I screwed up uh, I, I disagree. You did screw up. I, you, you did, but but I screwed up by not buying Bitcoin at hundred dollars. I mean, like you know. So did you, I. Yeah. So did I. So, we all did, right? We all so, have but, our levels so, of so, screw ups. So, so did I. My I my did. point my point is that if if what Bitcoin is going to do what you you are saying it's going to do in this room, even at two hundred thousand dollars, it's a steal. It's a steal. It's a, it's, a, it's I, Joe Joe. Look, let me let you into you know. It's just me and you right now. Let me let you into it. Of course, at some point, I'm going to reduce the get to one Bitcoin message, right? Of course, at some point, if I want to even stay in the space talking about Bitcoin, because people just won't be able to afford it. But right now, we've got people who have got multi-millions of dollars in net worth that are pussyfooting around trying to get to one Bitcoin. Those are the people I'm trying to protect right now. Like they that have worked 35 years, like my parents, I say that story all the time, to build a real estate portfolio that, that has basically underperformed because of the amount of money that's been printed, right? Those people need to get to one Bitcoin as a minimum to preserve the wealth that they're talking about. If you want, and I want to talk to people who are on a $50,000 a year salary with 10% disposable income, we can have that conversation, but that's a very different conversation. Look, that's the, that's British, British, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Brent Howe is completely right. Sorry. Look, I, I give you guys a one, really good example. One second, Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Can I, just one second. Uh, Fred, you are there because in five minutes I, I will need to leave and uh, in case maybe you're uh, British, I can make you host.
I'm a so co-host. I'm, I'm co-host as well, so I can hold it. Oh, okay. Um, I, I don't see. I see only two co-hosts. Oh, it says on my screen it says co-host, so. Not on mine. Is Tom, Sorry, Thomas? Just, yeah, it just, well, says, I just, I, it just says on my side it's co-host, but I'm, if it, you don't see it, then it's not working. Um. Okay. Well, let's, yeah, let's try to wrap it up in five minutes. So, look, I, I agree a million percent with what British Hoddle just said. So, look, I just found this out recently because I, I, I didn't know this. So, um, Warren Buffett for Berkshire Hathaway A stock, hmm. he, he never believes in stock splits. But the requirement to go to Omaha for his yearly conference was one share of Berkshire Hathaway stock. So, what they did is they made this maybe a colorful anecdote, but that's why they came out with Berkshire B, which is a whatever, $485 a share. So people could then actually go to the, the miracle of Omaha, whatever it's called. And so what happened is that's a unit bias conversation that we had. So, so British HODL's right. And if you can't, if you don't understand that you can buy a fractional share of a Bitcoin on Coinbase and the ETFs had already solved the unit bias problem. You could buy it for whatever, whatever is right now, 50, 60 bucks, depending upon how they, how they price the various spot Bitcoin ETFs. And if you can't make an allocation to it, buying it at one share at a time or 50, 60 bucks, you missed out. And you, you're not going to want to have that conversation in a year at a party. I'm giving you folks good advice. You know, you start stacking based upon rotate out of your, all your dogs, all your stocks that were losses that are sitting in unrealized loss gains. Talk to your accountant. You should rotate out of those into something responsible in your IRA accounts or in your you know, normal non-IRA accounts here in America. And make that rotation. And don't wait two weeks. We'll have this call in two weeks. And do you guys think the price of Bitcoin will be higher or lower than now? Yeah, I agree with that. Actually, as an asset money manager, um, that's a really well good framing grain. And that when you think about Bitcoin as a foundational asset, it's the first time we've ever had a foundational asset that literally... Um, goes up and to the right unlike any other asset that we've ever had right because it's 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 your capital and its currency like where cash it depreciates over time uh gold is uh not keeping up with inflation you know these types of portfolio anchors that are supposed to provide stability to a portfolio um they don't go up much in value right and so when you think about like the entire portfolio dropping down to a foundational asset like bitcoin the way i describe it and i wrote about it um on my website you no know, plug intended here is just that to make bitcoin a, a foundational asset Get rid of all the garbage in your portfolio. Look, the reason why ARC funds, for example, have not been able to uh, outperform uh, Bitcoin, there's too much friction in all their uh, in, on all their investments, right? Most of them don't make money. 23% of the revenues go to stock options. You know, there's virtually no friction in Bitcoin. You get free marketing, free advertising, as long as there's more demand than there is supply. It's going up, and it's, and it's going to keep getting more demand than there is supply for one reason. Because it's the most pure, pristine asset that's ever been offered to humanity, where all of humanity, for the first time ever, has complete control over our capital. So when you look at a portfolio model, get rid of the aggressive growth section of your portfolio and, and drop that down into Bitcoin. Get rid of the unprofitable companies, drop it down into Bitcoin. Get rid of overvalued long-term treasury bonds, drop it down into Bitcoin. You can get up to, I have like seniors that have, you know, 15, 20% positions in Bitcoin because, um, because, it will ensure they'll never. The, the biggest risk is outliving your money, and if you make Bitcoin a good solid portion, a foundational asset in your uh, portfolio, it's very unlikely for semi-wealthy and wealthy people to ever, you know, um, outlive their portfolio and run out of money when you when, when you just make these few adjustments. Overall risk long term in the portfolio, increasing your long term returns, and instead of thinking. Is he breaking up? For yeah, you? I can't hear him. Yeah. So, British, when, uh, cool. are you going to have uh, events in the future where you can't attend unless you have at least one Bitcoin or what? Absolutely. So Absolutely. You don't think there's you don't think there's going to be opportunities available for people with more than a certain amount of Bitcoin? What are, what are, what are we talking about here? Like, they, are they you gonna, know. We're going to have, like, uh, 
Berkshire's version of like B B B shares where you gotta have a million sats to go and it's for the rest of the, the hell no to along and hang out. Hell hell no. <laughs> hell no. It might be the first event where uh, we sell tickets to the bar, right? And then all the serious people actually be in the conference rather than the serious people being in the bar, which is what normally happens. Twenty one million club? I like it. But look, look, I got, I got to bounce off, but um, I just wanted to say, listen, everyone, start getting fucking serious. Like, I can't even begin to explain because we've got an all-time high before the before the halving right now. We've got capital flowing in that, that's like a billion dollars a day. That didn't happen in the last cycle. I don't care what anyone says. There was maybe two or three days in the last cycle where you got a billion dollars of inflows in a single day. That's now almost happening on a repeat basis. <laughs> like, this is a phenomenal thing that's happening. Listen, I love Joe, but stop listening to Joe about how mediocre you are. Start believing in yourself. Get to one Bitcoin. Start buying enough Bitcoin before you run out of fucking time. And you'll, you, even though you, if you don't like my language, you don't like anything else I do, just get to one Bitcoin for yourself, your family, your last name, if you ever wanted to mean anything.